Hello, everybody. I'm Helena Carbon. I'm the president of Just World Educational, a small but feisty nonprofit that works to educate Americans and others about the need to end wars, to uphold the rights of Palestinians and all other peoples who've been the targets of settler colonialism, and to work together with all the peoples of the world to build a just and life-affirming world order. I'm sitting today on the traditional lands of the Piscataways in an area currently known as Washington, D.C. Today, I welcome you to a very special web-based conversation that Just World Ed is presenting that features two of our board members, who are people who knew the late Daniel Ellsberg well and over a long period of time. I am truly honored to sit with these two much valued friends and colleagues as they share some of their fondest memories and closest assessments of Dan Ellsberg's life and legacy. One of our conversants today is Richard Falk, an extremely distinguished international jurist who has played a strong role in the peace movement here in the United States for several decades, going back to the era of the US Vietnam War. Richard Falk was indeed one of the handful of people to whom Dan Ellsberg gave a copy of the Pentagon Papers before they were published in 1971 by the New York Times. Richard has also had a long involvement with issues of Palestinian rights, having served a distinguished term as the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Palestinian Rights back in 2008 through 2014. Richard, it's wonderful to have you with us from your summer home in Turkey today. Well, it's great to be with both of you. I look forward to our conversation. And um, I won't say anything now, unless you want me to. Um, no, just having your, your words of greeting, I think that, that's super. <laughs> I think um, this is a special event. It's the first time at least I've had to, since Dan's uh, death, that I've had the opportunity to reflect upon his legacy, and I do so in the company of people I trust and love. Thank you so much. Our other conversant today is Nora Barrows Friedman. Nora is best known as the longtime co-host of the Electronic Intifada podcast. She also hosts a podcast called The Brief, Tracking the Empire. And she was the author of In Our Power, U.S. Students Organizing for Justice in Palestine. Nora had the amazing good luck of, as I understand it, growing up in a household in which Dan Ellsberg was a close family friend. And he remained a strong influence on her generally badass commitment to social justice for the rest of his life. <laughs> Nora, thanks so much for being with us from the Bay Area and for being really a big inspiration for the conversation we're having here today. Oh, thank you so much, Helena and Richard. Um, I just, I, yeah, I, I echo Richard's sentiment. It's, it's an honor to be amongst such good people and such good friends and and mentors for me in so many ways. So thank you. In today's conversation, Nora and Richard will both be sharing more details about their interactions with Dan Ellsberg over the years. The first part of the conversation will be largely chronological as we review Dan Ellsberg's lengthy and very notable life trajectory. Then around halfway through, we'll start unpacking some of the relevance of the lessons Dan taught us as we look at the situation today in the United States, in the corporate media in this country, and regarding the war in Ukraine. We hope we will have time for some Q&A at the end of today's conversation. But whether we do have time for that or not, we have also created a special Google form that you should receive automatically at the point when you leave the webinar, or it ends, and on that form, we invite you to share any memories, observations, or reflections you might have about the life and legacy of Dan Ellsberg, so that later we might, with your permission, add them to some kind of a public tribute board that we'll be posting on our website. So do look out for that form as you leave the webinar. 
If you'd like to submit a question to the Q&A, please do so through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. I also want to give a shout out to my colleague, Amel Zaroug, who is providing tech support for this webinar. She's already started live streaming it to, to YouTube. We will later be sharing a link to the recording of the conversation that you can share with any of your friends or colleagues who are unable to be with us today. Also, if you're having any technical problems or questions during the webinar, please send a direct message to Amel Zaroug via the chat box. So now, on to our conversation. Richard Falk, I'm going to start with you um, to ask you to trace the trajectory of Dan Ellsberg's early professional life and how you saw him when you were both at Harvard together as brilliant and incisive, but at that point, wrong-headed. Um, <laughs> So yeah, um, I know you've written a bit about this, but we have lots of follow-up questions. Good, no, I've thought about it too. Um, I mean, it was um, uh, a strange meeting because uh, we had a common friend who was a journalist who thought we should know each other and uh, organized this little informal dinner party in which we got along terribly. <laughs> And uh, Dan was at the height of his uh, uh, kind of patriotic, uh, mainstream Cold War militarist. And, uh, and so, so hang on, I, roughly, I, roughly what date would that have been? Appreciated his uh, mental problems. Uh, I thought he was obviously a, br a brilliant def so called defense intellectual. Uh, in the main, in the political mainstream, but ha having gone through that uh, recollection, I had two further thoughts about his trajectory. The, the first is that if he had not had that preliminary uh, rise to prominence as a strategic uh, upcoming star of the Rand Pentagon world, he would never have had access to the secret papers. In other words, integral to his uh, later reasons that we're all gathered here to celebrate his life is that part of his life that we wouldn't have gathered to celebrate. Uh, and and that, it, there's a strange irony connected with that. And there's a further aspect of that, that Dan, unlike uh, any other public intellectual I've known, only focused on issues that he was, had firsthand exposure to. Uh, he he was not a kind of uh, a dilettante in my style of uh, dealing with lots of different things that came along. Uh, for instance, he never did deal with Palestine and Israel, as far as I know, at least publicly. And uh, and so it's it's a very special kind of uh, can configure this evolution into this special form of whistleblowing uh, and heroic uh, figure who inspires so many people around the world because he tells the, uh, the, the really dangerous behavior of the most powerful state in the world. And that's a, uh, takes a lot of, and it took two kinds of courage. One was to tell the secrets, to disclose the secrets. The other was to break these bonds, personal bonds with the upper elite in American uh, society. Even people who change their minds, and I've known a few of them over the years, they're very reluctant to publicly burn their bridges. 
but Dan was willing to once he saw and, and let me finally say that one of the things that impressed me at that dinner, even though we disagreed, was that he um, uh, exuded a sense of moral certitude, and that he was uh, he projected this image that I'm doing the right thing, and I think that pervaded his life uh, until the very end. That kind of moral certitude that was formed in his uh, mainstream militarist patriotic phase served quite different purposes for the bulk of his life. And so he's it's it, he's a fascinating figure to take account of, in addition to celebrating his legacy. Yeah, interesting. Um, I guess I saw a uh, an interview with him on uh, Democracy Now! recently in which he spoke about the kind of the special bond among people who are the keepers of the utmost secrets um, and, and, you know, how they look down on people who don't have those kind of top secret clearances. So this speaks to what you were talking about, Richard, that he was prepared to break those bonds. Um, and actually yeah. in, his, uh, in his memoir, Secrets, he talked about how when, Henry, when he first encountered Henry Kissinger, who was sort of newer to the secrets confrerie than he was, that he took Kissinger aside and said, you're going to learn all these things. <laughs> it was quite a, quite a sweet little um, vignette of his welcoming Kissinger into the, into the coterie of the secret holders. But obviously, you know, something happened. And this to me is very interesting. Something happened around 1969, 68, 69. First of all, as a you know, well-respected defense intellectual, obviously he'd been having a lot of doubts, but not voicing them, but he went to two conferences in 69. One was at Princeton, um, co-hosted by the Woodrow Wilson School, which I'm sure has been renamed in, in the last year or so, the Woodrow Wilson School and the American Friends Service Committee. Um, and then the second one was at Haverford I was, College. I was the co-chair of that. That conference with oh the, the one at Princeton yes with Honey Knopf it was on revolution it was and it brought together uh, many of the leading anti-war activists and Dan told at that meet at that meeting how he encountered a Gandhian woman who was extremely persuasive to him but he had several narratives for his transformation. This was just one of them. <laughs> Interesting. He, yes, he, he wrote in his memoir, Secrets, how this uh, Gandhian woman whose name was Janaki something, um, yes. how sh she had said to him, you know, in, in our culture, we don't have the need to have an enemy. And he was like, his, he was blown away. Like, how can, how can you exist in life without enemies? So, um, so then he went to a, a follow-up conference at Haverford College, which is a, a Quaker college. Um, and this time it, it was the War Resisters League that was holding the conference. And um, he met somebody called Randy Cooler, I think, who, was, who announced proudly that he was going to go to jail for draft resistance. And that this was, I, I mean, the way he told it, and maybe as you said, Richard, he had a lot of conversion narratives, different aspects of the same thing, but he heard Randy Cooler speak and then he went and he sat in the men's room at Haverford and, and sat slumped on the floor sobbing for an hour. So, so you know, it, it must have been huge for him. Um, so, what kind of outreach did you have with him through this conversion period that led up also to him sharing the, uh, the Pentagon Papers with you, Richard? Uh, let me just say the end of the uh, Randy Keeler story was that the reason he was sobbing was why didn't he wake up sooner? 
see, he held himself accountable for being so slow to tra to make this transformation. Uh, I had a because of being active uh, in opposing the war, and we knew many of the same people. Uh, and at P Princeton was a good place to organize events, and we had several important events that he participated in at Princeton that were, uh, I think, uh, in this pre-Pentagon Papers period uh, that g gave him the uh, both the confidence and the sense that he had to be prepared to take huge personal risks if he was to do the right thing in his terms within this context. In the, the time he gave me the papers, it was after a teaching, public teaching at which a Indiana Senator, Vance Hartke, and a California Congressman, Pete McCloskey, both also participated. And he tried to give the papers to them, but they refused to accept highly classified uh, material. And so I was not w prudent enough and accepted them and was visited by the FBI two days later, which uh, didn't turn out to be such a disaster, but not a very pleasant encounter. Wow. So, um the feds did bring a case against Dan Ellsberg, and I'm just reiterating some of this because I'm hoping that our webinar today will be shared with a lot of people in the younger generations who are not as intimately familiar with Dan Ellsberg's story as, as some of us. Um, so the feds did try to, to um, prosecute him but their prosecution fell apart when it was revealed that the Nixon administration had sent these undercover operatives later known as the plumbers to check out the records in his psychiatrist's office. So it was in a sense, a kind of a, a real screw up by the feds that led to him not being um, in, prosecuted and quite possibly imprisoned. So now I want to come to you, Nora, because um, I'm imagining you were not even born or maybe a baby in arms at the time of the Pentagon Papers. Um, but, you know, growing up with him as a close friend of your family, tell me how that was, you know, how you viewed him, what it was like to, to grow up, I'm assuming, in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. with, um, you know, Dan Ellsberg popping by every so often. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was born in 1978, so it had already been, you know, seven years uh, since the Pentagon Papers were released, and Dan, uh, you know, evaded jail, um, and I didn't, I think my mom um, was, uh, became friends with Dan and Patricia when I was about 10 or 11. So it was still, you know, it was about 1990 or something by the time um, that, uh, that I, you know, happened to have him in my life, um, him and Patricia both. And, uh, you know, it was, I mean, growing up in Berkeley, you know, to like in, in a fairly political family, um, it wasn't unusual for me to be around, you know, kind of like in like a satellite to people who were extraordinary. Um, I mean, you know, my mom uh, is a, a, a poet and a, a writer and a psychology professor and, a, you know, clinical psychologist herself. And so I remember as a kid going to June Jordan's house in Oakland, um, because she and my mom were friends, you know, like this kind of thing. So um it was it, it was you know just kind of normal for for me I mean so so lucky I was so lucky you know I got to be around these real revolutionaries um and and so when 
when Dan and Patricia came into my life, um, you know, I was, I was barely, you know, I was in middle school. Um, and, uh, but I had already been, you know, becoming politicized. It was, you know, right after the first Gulf war, um, I, I had, uh, been to a, a summer camp for socialist youth in Cuba um, the the summer before the first uh, war on Iraq. And so I felt like my political principles were just starting to form. And so when, you know, when when Dan and Patricia were around and I learned about who exactly Dan and Patricia were and the significance of what they had done, um, uh, you know, it just kind of, I don't know, it was, it was, it was really moving and special for me to be able to grow up in that kind of environment where, where, where Dan was, was a, a member of our extended family and, um, you know, just, just being around him, you know, as, as I grew up, as I, you know, kind of got into radio as I got into journalism. And then, you know, the last 20 years of my life has been dedicated to um, reporting on, on Palestine and Palestinian human rights issues. And, um, you know, just having him uh, as this constant presence of someone who, you know, had, 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 the courage and the confidence to do what he did um you know a, a re, like he was he, he and he didn't just you know talk about what he did in 19 you know 71 it was like he was constantly out there he was constantly willing to get arrested again and again and again um to you know as part of his his you know like richard said his like his values, his moral compass um, to stop war, to stop, you know, nuclear arms proliferation, um, to keep uh, being, you know, this, this, this voice of courage and a mentor to other whistleblowers. Um, you know, I mean, he was one of the strongest voices for of defense for Chelsea Manning, for Julian Assange, um, for Ed Snowden, you know he really was. I, I I know that Snowden has talked about how Dan was was a mentor for him, and um, you know it was he. So so he just never stopped. You know he never he was never content just to uh, take a break from it all and you know, in, until, you know, his last days, he was, um, he was still talking about how, you know, he, he wanted more information on the kinds of F-16 fighter jets that the U.S. was sending to the Ukrainian military. Um, he wanted, he, you know, he, he was like, he needed to, to keep going and to, to keep talking about, uh, the, the, the insanity of war. Um, and that was just who he was. And so it was like this, you know, really extraordinary, um, way to, to, to grow up, um, you know, and even though, you know, Dan didn't, didn't, uh, focus on, on Palestine, um, in his work, uh, he was, he was absolutely right there, you know, with me and, and, and with Richard, um, in terms of of his values and his principles, and um, yeah, it was. I, I just there's so much gratitude that I have for him to be able to have um, to have been a kid, and then a teenager, a young adult, and now I'm in my mid forties, um, knowing Dan, you know, as long as I did. Wow, that sounds. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go back to like the the kind of the, the formal aspects of of Dan Ellsberg's work a while because um, he he did publish this 2003 memoir called Secrets that I think is is a great read. Um, but 
to me, the most important book was the 2018 book, The Doomsday Machine, which um, was a sort of a recreation of everything that he had learned during his time at RAND. And the RAND Corporation has always been this kind of strange, what the British call a quango, a quasi non-governmental organization. Um, maybe more governmental than non-governmental, but it was founded by the Air Force, but they do sort of intellectual work. And he had gathered a lot of materials, both archival materials and his own research on the status of nuclear readiness, particularly in, the, um, in East Asia and the Asian Pacific. Um, and he had discovered that like the, the launch, instructions for commanders were incredibly risky you know that a commander in guam or in uh, okinawa could just launch nuclear weapons with with very little um control that that was one of the things interestingly what i learned from the book is that when when dan elsberg originally did that huge copying job of all those papers from the Pentagon, he had two tranches of material, one concerning Vietnam and the other concerning nuclear weapons. And he ha had to make a decision, which one do I release first? So he released the Vietnam tranche and then the feds were after him. So he, he bundled up the second tranche of, of secret papers, gave them to his brother and his brother, well, I guess there was some kind of a um, flood and his brother lost the whole lot in, in a flood. So, so, you know, all those materials were lost, which I think is an amazing story. But over the years since then, Dan Ellsberg was able to recreate, including because of a lot of um, subsequently declassified materials, he was able to recreate, and probably from his own memory, a lot of what he had learned, including both that kind of launch on warning or launch absent warning um, regime that there was for the commanders in the Asia Pacific, but also regarding the Cuban Missile Crisis. So, I mean, I, I just think it's really important for people to understand and, and connect with that aspect of Dan Ellsberg's work as, as well as his Vietnam work. Richard, um, from your perspective, what, what, do you, what did you find um, most compelling about the doomsday machine and, ab and about you know, Dan Ellsberg's um, revelations regarding nuclear risks? Well, I think uh, you introduced it uh, very accurately. I think the launch on warning uh, did scare him and uh, and scared him not only for himself but for humanity as a whole, so to speak. And and then uh, my impression was, uh, and I think it's uh, sufficiently developed in the book too. Uh, he also was very suspicious of the military people who were ready to wage nuclear war uh, to gain strategic advantage. In other words, he didn't see the real doctrine, the existential doctrine of deterrence as purely defensive, that it had offensive and in his view, uh, uh, so uh, violative of norms and really of mental stability that, I mean, it was bordering on insane. Uh, what, uh, and, and that uh, was confirmed, I think, for him in, in uh, the high, in the, in the way in which the Cuban Missile Crisis unfolded where the military people were all ready to have a confrontation and to initiate uh, violence that would have uh, produced retaliation and uh, fairly quickly escalated to some kind of war. So that I think that 
uh, he was a kind of guardian at the gate, so to speak, who uh, tried to warn uh, American society and anyone who would listen, essentially, that we had to get out of this nuclear game. And he was very closely associated with the uh, Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, which I've worked with over the years, too, and is headed by David Krieger, who was very dedicated to these uh, ends also, and uh, helped them uh, in ways of uh, securing uh, some and things of that sort. So, the issue of the Vietnamese ended into each other in important ways because he lost his uh, trust in the U.S. government, which, you know, and one of the strange things about per his personal profile is it's very unusual for a talented Harvard student to volunteer for the Marine Corps. You know, in the, uh, when he had very promising career alternatives, I, I've never known anyone uh, who d did something of that sort. And uh, it's, it, and especially with, you know, being uh, already honored as a undergraduate and kind of a undergraduate celebrity, so to speak. Uh, but still, to, in 1954, I believe it was, to volunteer to uh, serve as a Marine. Uh, and he went to the Middle East, actually, not to Vietnam, and was involved, I think, not in any serious way, but in the Suez operation that period 1956 and i think that's all part of what makes him uh, so extraordinary is that he uh, in a way dove deeper into militarism than most people at least i've known who are on the right i mean are conservative people and yet he was able to reverse field, you know, it's like a, a runner on foot in football that is able to elude tackles by completely reversing the direction he's going in. And always with this moral certitude as a foundation for taking risks and for doing what he thought he should do. Interesting. So I suppose if he was in the Middle East in, uh, or as I call it, West Asia, um, in uh, the mid 50s, that would have been as part of a good American initiative to push back the uh, British French um, Israeli attack it's on the, the last good initiative. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, Coming forward a bit, um, Nora, to the 90s when he was a, a feature in your life. I, I saw recently, and I think we put it onto our website, a, f a photo of him addressing a, uh, an anti-nuclear rally at the in 1999 at the time of uh, NATO's 50th um, anniversary. And here we are nearly 25 years later, and NATO is still bigger. and still nuclear and um where is dan, dan ellsberg when, when we need him but what other kind of issues did you see him being active on in you know from the time that you were aware of of his social activism i mean that was you know i think that was his life's work was the anti-nuclear work um he you know he was a, a you know a a, a staunch anti-war activist and 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 intellectual um but his his i i you know i mean he was really you said it like you know along with 
the Pentagon Papers, he um, he copied, you know, thousands and thousands of pages of the U.S.'s secret nuclear weapons program, um, and you know, it was. I mean, when he was writing the Doomsday Machine, um, which was published about five years ago, he uh, had me and my husband Zach and um, our our son Dashiell, who was very young at the he was like a baby we were changing his diapers on their living room floor um and my mom over I think it was like every week for a few months um we'd go over and Dan would have um you know several new sections that he had written uh, for the book and he just wanted feedback um on you know on the content and on the structure and all of this and I mean, so he was, you know, he, we'd, we'd get there and, you know, we'd sit around the living room table and he'd go, okay, are you ready? I'm like, yeah, we're ready. He would just launch into the, the most horrifying nightmarish scenarios that were being discussed, um, you know, around boardrooms at the Rand Corporation and at the Pentagon by, you know, by some of the most, um, uh, insane U.S. officials at the time um, who were knowingly um, preparing for and kind of coming up with scenarios for total nuclear annihilation of the planet. Um, and he had all of this information still in his head you know, I mean, he had his manuscript out in front of him, but he was like, oh, yeah, I think it was a Tuesday, it was 1958, and I was at this, you know, someone, some general, you know, it was just like, he knew, he had a photographic memory, and he was talking about how, you know, the numbers of uh, the first wave, you know, after a nuclear bomb would hit somewhere, there would be X number of uh, millions of people dead. And that how actually that he, he realized um, uh, that that the numbers were were being suppressed, like they mm -hmm. the, the 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 actual numbers of what could happen to people in in a nuclear a first strike sort of nuclear um, war uh, were exponentially higher. And he would sit there and say you know, so we have, you know, first wave, you know, X number of millions of people are dead instantly. And then you have, you know, what, what, uh, what's called the nuclear winter, right? So like these huge plumes of smoke from burning cities um, would, would, you know, darken the skies, it would kill all the crop. I mean, so he was like, talking about this very factually, which was Dan's way, um, just the most uh, horrifying, horrific scenarios. And, and he was, you know, he was very matter of fact about, about the dangers, the actual, you know, like literal dangers and uh, of, of nuclear weapons and how um, just mandatory it was to, 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 to stop it, to stop this madness. Um, and so, you know, in the nineties, he was, he was getting arrested. Um, he was speaking out about, you know, the, the dangers of nuclear war, the dangers of a uh, nuclear NATO. Um, I mean, he was very much, you know, still, still living and walking and breathing and talking um, about his experiences and what he had discovered and what he had revealed um, at, you know, during his time in, in the, the, the belly of the beast. Um, and so, yeah, so that's, I mean, <laughs> it was, you know, as, as a kid, um, before I, uh, I knew Dan and Patricia, um, you know, there was, uh, I, I just feel like, you know, in, in the eighties and nineties, um, there were a lot of like Hollywood movies about nuclear war. There was, um, you know, I mean, the Cold War was still happening. There was, uh, there was this kind of like 
um, kind of collective uh, fear of, of nuclear war, but Dan knew the details. He knew um, exactly what could happen. And, and he just, I mean, he had it all in his head. He was able to thankfully write it all down. Um, you know, like, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you mentioned the, the documents that he had to give to his brother um, that were lost. I think they were like in some, uh, some like industrial compost uh, area and then it got flooded and, and they tried to find the documents and they were like put in some old oven, like a, an old stove that was in this like compost area, something like an old junkyard or something. And they were completely lost, but Dan was able to, um, to, to recreate what he needed um, from these de declassified documents and from his own photographic memory. Um, and I, and I, I know that it was, um, you know, it was his life's work, uh, really to, to, to do the, the nuclear secrets, um, expose. And that's, you know, I think he was really, um, satisfied by being able to publish, uh, the doomsday machine in, in 2018. Um, but he never stopped even after that. And, and, you know, even after, um, his diagnosis, he was just, he was still, committed to, to trying to end the madness. Could I just add a couple of footnotes to what uh, Norris just said so well? One, uh, I, I'm glad that you um, elucidated for us the way in which he focused on details. Yeah. And he made you experience details as large insights. You know, it wasn't, he, he not only transformed himself, he transformed these details into illumination. And I've never known anyone that did that. I mean, who had that ability to look very carefully at what most people put, you know, uh, uh, don't uh, put aside very quickly. The other, the other thing, I think uh, also was implicit in uh, what you were saying, Nora, is that he had a quality of seriousness about this work that contrasted, in my experience, with the typical grand intele defense intellectual who made joke. They had all kinds of gallows humor and. Uh, you you felt it was for them a game, and for Dan it was an unfolding tragedy. Mm -hmm. And in my you know I had these two long conversations with him. Uh, oh, I I guess uh, three weeks or so before he died, and uh, he he one of his, the things he stressed was he didn't see any prospect for avoiding the a nuclear catastrophe and he raised as he he said that people talk about it as an extinction event but will it be a real extinction event he conjectured as, and I'm using his words as I remember them without a photographic memory uh, uh, he said, um, some people will survive, maybe eight, eight to 10 percent. And that's a large, uh, this is still his words, that's a large number of people. So it's, uh, he was concerned with not defining uh, even this terminal nuclear uh, tragedy as extinction, but as something that was a severe stressing of human experience as we knew it. And it was quite interesting. Again, I never heard of anyone else dwell on that particular issue of how literally we talk about uh, species extinction. Yeah, it was very, um, very clinical 
how he spoke about it. Yeah, um, oh, you, he spoke to you too. Yes, he raised yeah. he, he raised it in this con. Con. He wanted to have these con. This con. These two conversations, and he raised these sorts of issues. In, I mean, I guess they were kind of terminal or lingering issues in his mind, and he there he expressed the fact that he felt he had had a good life and that he had lived long enough. Yeah. I mean, he was uh, very much at peace with the diagnosis and with uh, how his life was ending, the, 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 uh, the opportunities to let more people know that there that this danger lurks over them and that the leaders are asleep, you know, uh, all those very disturbing realities that he was very uh, keenly aware of. Yeah. So, um, Richard, in what you said, and I think you wrote about this also, that Dan Ellsberg had told you that quite possibly eight or 10 percent of humanity could survive the um, a nuclear holocaust but was it you or were you quoting Dan when you said that the the situation of that eight to ten percent of, of humanity that is left will be a horrible situation because you know the, the whole I'm, of, I'm, of in our conversation anyway I said that I'm uh, you know will this survivors envy the dead. I mean, it's, uh, uh, and he sort of, he didn't want to talk about it and he, did, he sort of evaded the issue as I remember, as I remember. I mean, he didn't imply that it would be a, a, a lovely uh, festival of humanity or some kind of uh, uh, positive climax, but he, uh, he, he he wasn't. Uh, I, I guess he hadn't thought enough about that. Uh, what kind of life the, those survivors would be confronting? Yeah. Who they were and where they were. You know, would, it's a, if you think about it seriously, it, which is the only way he thought about anything, uh, it would. Uh, it, it's a com quite complicated question. You know, who's do you do people in remote mountains or some you know indigenous communities or who survives in yeah. a situation of near extinction? I mean, I, I would say extinction of civilization as we know it, <laughs> um, but you know, obviously, civilization as we know it is not great for. A large you number of people. Anyway, Gandhi, Gandhi's quote when he was asked, "Be good if they had one." <laughs> Western, yeah. What do you think of Western civilization? He said, "Yes, could be nice if they had one." Um, so I, I, I'm just so moved by all these uh, lovely recollections that the two of you are sharing. I want to just move quickly to um, two current issues where I think the legacy of Dan Ellsberg can be really useful and um, helpful to people trying to think through difficult issues. And one is the war in Ukraine and the parallels that it has with Vietnam. On this Democracy Now! interview that I saw that he conducted with Amy Goodman in April, he said, you know, that he's very afraid that what is happening now regarding decision making on Ukraine is very similar to what he saw happening regarding decision making on Vietnam, that everybody inside the military industrial complex or the national security complex or whatever knows it's it's failing. But they are not telling, they are lying to us. So um, I, I don't know how much of that he had shared with either of you during your last conversations or, or what 
reflections either of you has on that um, perspective. I can say a few words. He, he, we didn't talk about Ukraine beyond uh, the sort of bottom line of his feeling that it was uh, that there was a big escalation danger uh, embedded in American policy. And from the outset, uh, <clears throat> uh, but I think uh, his assessment of the Cuban Missile Crisis is also relevant that uh, one drifts into a situation uh, from which there's no good exit strategy. And he, I think he felt that was happening in Ukraine. That, you know, and uh, many people have quoted the JFK uh, statement from his 19 American University talk where he said, the one thing in the nuclear age you shouldn't do is force a leader of a nuclear country into the choice between surrender and the use of nuclear weapons. And I think uh, Biden was heading in that direction. I, one feels that he's sort of backing off, but not in a very uh, impressive way. Uh, far as I can tell. Um, Nora, do you have anything that you, you know, can share about Dan Ellsberg's views on, on Ukraine, the Ukraine war? Not really. I mean, we hadn't, you know, because of COVID and everything, um, we hadn't talked that much um, since last February, uh, save for, you know, a few times. And, and those times were spent just hanging out and and seeing each other um but i mean i know that that yeah i mean I, I echo what richard said and you know dan um had said very publicly that you know that that the u.s uh you know imperialism um and and western imperialism and and the use of yeah the, the, that that we were skating so horrifyingly close um to what he had always warned about um and that it, it seemed to him that like no one was taking it seriously um and that you know the the people like julian assange um who had done what he had done to expose crimes of this government um you know in such uh in such dangerous circumstances um, that he was afraid that whistleblowers for, you know, what was happening now would be afraid to come out. Um, there's this incredible quote. I want to read it. Um, it's, uh, let's see, Richard Becker from the Answer Coalition wrote um, this wonderful tribute to Dan uh, in Liberation News. And he said, Dan said, um, in a, in a 2018 interview, so long before the, you know, the Ukraine situation, um, he said, uh, you know, addressing others um, in the national security apparatus who are working now and who don't know, um, uh, you know, who, who know about uh, this, this country's criminal actions um, and being afraid to come forward. Dan said, my message to them is don't do what I did. Don't wait till the bombs are actually falling or thousands more have died before you do what I wish I had done years earlier in 64 or even 61 on the nuclear issue. And that is reveal the truth that you know, the dangerous truths that are being withheld by the government at whatever cost to yourself, whatever risk that may take. Consider doing that because a war's worth of lives may be at stake. Or in the case of the two existential crises I'm talking about, the future of humanity is at stake. And I think that was, I mean, that was his, that was his moral clarity. That was his through line. Um, wow, that's a yeah. powerful quote. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for sharing. Um, so you mentioned, obviously, Julian Assange, and I would like us to quickly um, 
assess what is what has changed specifically with the corporate media in this country between 1971 when the new york times avidly you know published the pentagon papers and then helped dan ellsberg to defend himself um, in the courts and you know the court of public opinion and the way the corporate media are treating Julian Assange who back in the day they they used his material about misdeeds in Iraq or elsewhere but now they are completely silent on yeah. the need to free Julian Assange what has happened oh Richard <laughs> go first <laughs> I, I see, I think uh, part of, uh, it's not such so much what has happened, but who was Dan Ellsberg and who is Julian Assange? And Dan Ellsberg came from the uh, most elite possible uh, defense intellectual background. And he was, uh, it, 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 it was, um, and it was a time you know, Dan didn't, uh, we, at that, I remember that we had, uh, uh, I wouldn't say disagreement, but we had discussions. He had these great faith that if the American people were exposed to these Pentagon papers, they would turn uh, very uh, quickly and abruptly against uh, their leaders and the lying and the and I was much more skeptical, I, I have to admit. Uh, that they, which, but it was a time when, the, when public opinion was already against the war. See, and and uh, that, that's not the case here with uh, uh, the, the Ukraine issues or uh, Assange. See, and Assange is seen as a kind of shadowy figure from below who had dealings with Russia and uh, he didn't have the kind of uh, uh, credibility, if one puts it that way, uh, that Dan had. I mean, he, uh, uh, he had the maximum credibility you can have as a young American. He was uh, a, a enlisted in the Marines. He was a, a RAND star. He was a consultant to the most influential people in the country. And when he spoke, you almost had to listen. And when these other, Snowden is the closest. Snowden is a closer example. But uh, he, he was more of a kind of uh, anonymous figure. He didn't have the vividness of personality or the background uh, that Dan had. Dan was a very unique figure in American uh, uh, political culture uh, and it remains that. I mean, I hope there's a good biography underway to, because it, 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 he's, he's not so easy uh, to encapsulate if you look at his life as a whole and look at the fact that he, that the early part of his life that he himself disowned was integral to the success of his later life that he, that he very much affirmed and all of us are affirmed. I don't know of any similar story. So um, Nora, any thoughts on Whistleblowing and uh, the corp the change in the corporate media. Um, yeah, I mean, I I I I just want to um, kind of reflect on on something that Richard just said too. Like, I remember Dan saying, you know, he he was convinced that that when he released the Pentagon Papers, that American um, the the rest of American opinion uh, would would turn against the war, and you know I think I th I think that that his views on that um, 
absolutely changed when he saw, you know, through the, the rest of the 70s and then the 80s and then the 90s and then, you know, the, the war on Iraq um, where in which, you know, millions of people all around the world um, tried to stop in, in the con kind of conventional, you know, protest movements um, when it, it was clear that the leaders, you know, didn't didn't care anymore about public opinion, that um, that really they were going to do exactly what they wanted to do, even when there were, you know, throngs of of people, you know, former military experts, um, you know, activists, you know, anybody. Uh, Dan Ellsberg himself uh, was saying that, you know, that the war in Iraq was built on you know, like uh, it was, it was a structurally sound, you know, as like a bowl of noodles. Um, and, and that we were going there to further Western empire. We are going there to destroy a country. Um, and that no matter how much truth came out about, uh, you know, what, what was actually happening in Iraq and Afghanistan, of course, um, that it that um, for whatever reason Americans just didn't care that much, um, and and I think I, I think that was really hard for him. Um, I know it was really hard for him. Um, I know that you know he he was also convinced that if if Americans knew the truth about the nuclear weapons program and and nuclear proliferation and all the things that he knew by heart so clinically about uh the threat and the danger of nuclear war that people would be up in arms um and that and that that didn't happen as well um and so i think the fact that julian assange has been languishing in a prison dungeon for so long um simply for exposing like dan did what was you know what the aims of of western empire were and and the war crimes that that it was covering up um i think it was really frustrating for dan um and you know but he in true dan fashion you know he remained um absolutely um you know steadfast in support of of Julian Assange, of of Chelsea Manning, of Edward Snowden, of um, other whistleblowers who are less known, like uh, I believe his name is Daniel Hale, who um, apparently uh, it, he's in prison, um, and and he put Dan on his um, you know very short list of people who are able to call and and have conversations with him in prison, and I think they were talking, you know, every week. Um, pretty much until the, the last couple of weeks of Dan's life. Um, and so even though there was this uh, real, you know, like, I mean, you tear your hair out, like I'm giving you people all of this information and yet there still is, you know, there's hardly any change um, in terms of, you know, our ability to, to get the government and the weapons con contractors and the, you know, the, the arms makers to stop what they're doing. Um, and, and, you know, and it's not happening. I think that, that he was so invested in cultivating and protecting and defending the next generation of whistleblowers because, uh, you know, it, it, that was so important, so important. I mean, more than important, it was essential. Um, to him, and and that, I, I think that's that's gonna that's gonna remain one of the 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 most um, valuable, you know, legacies that Dan is leaving us. Can I just add one small point, um, which is that um, one of the lessons that the a establishment learned from the defeat in Vietnam was to depoliticize the citizenry. And, and uh, in a certain odd way, uh, what Nora has been saying about Dan's frustrations uh, reflects the success of the government in getting the media 
uh, to be basically an instrument of state propaganda when it comes to foreign policy. And, and it's very hard to go against that. He was only a welcome guest when they knew he was dying. I mean, that's right. Yeah, I mean, the New York Times ignored him for decades, and then yes. finally, right. Uh, and he couldn't. He couldn't do. Uh, they. I mean, there's a common sense view that he, having so little time left to live, he couldn't do that much damage to the. Uh, propaganda machine uh, that the media has become, the mainstream media. And uh, I think that uh, these lessons of the Vietnam War that were learned by the, they lost the war, but maybe they won the peace. See, and we haven't faced that issue. Uh, you know, they, they it's not only the volunteer army and, you know, they did everything possible to demobilize and depoliticize the citizenry because the anti-war movement had been a challenge. You know, even to Nixon, went crazy, almost went crazy uh, with the confrontations in Washington after the Cambodia uh, uh, so-called incursion. And and so I think, I think that's part of why the struggle was it was and is so difficult in given this structure of state and society and why whistleblowing is so important because that is a way of penetrating uh, this kind of uh, repressive way in which state society relations have evolved since Vietnam. Wow, a lot to think about. And definitely, I mean, this matter of the state having been able to, in effect, co-opt the corporate media to the extent that it has is a huge part of what we're all dealing with. Um, I'm afraid our time is probably up, although I, I just wish I were in the same room with Richard and uh, Nora. It's just amazing to have a conversation with Richard in Turkey and with Nora in California and me here in Washington, DC, and with all of you who are, have been hang, hanging on and every word from our two wonderful board members here. Um, so, so much to think about. We will be putting the, uh, the video onto our website. And when you, the attendees, when you, when you leave the, um, the webinar, please do fill out the poll because we're inviting you to contribute to um, a public tribute board that we will be creating for Dan Ellsberg and, and his family. I um, want to thank you all for hanging in with us for mm, 70 minutes here. I want to remind everybody that Just World Educational is a teeny weeny nonprofit organization that is totally reliant on your donations. So if you're able to donate to keep us going and to have incredibly rich conversations like this one, that would be awesome. Um, please, um, you'll find actually the link in the uh, exit poll, the, um, the link to donate to us. So first of all, I wanna turn to you, Richard Falk, and thank you really very deeply for your super contribution here and everything that you've shared. Oh, well, thank you, Helena. You made it all hang together for <laughs> us. And I, I very much benefited from being with Nora and you. And I think in the time we had available, we touched on some of the key aspects of Dan's extraordinary life and legacy yeah thank you richard and um and you nora you i mean i hate to put you in this spot but you are our kind of ambassador to the coming generations so <laughs> it's just amazing to have your um really rich memories of of your time with dan and the effect he had on you and and 
the ways he had you think about the world. So thank you for being with us. Oh, thank you so much. We didn't even get to talk about his other, you know, his uh, the other aspects of his personality, like how he was an incredible magician and <laughs> and a, a, a pianist um, and how much he loved films and uh, how funny he was. And, and so all of those things. Um, yeah, I just, I, I and I'm, I'm so grateful for, for this opportunity to, to talk about him and to hear from, I mean, Richard, who's one of my favorite people in the whole world. Um, one of my earliest mentors when I was getting into this whole Palestine, uh, reporting career, um, and has been with me every step of the way. And, um, and and thank you so much, Helena, for all that you do and for bringing us together to, to celebrate Dan. Well, clearly we have to have another session and talk about his magic <laughs> tricks. <laughs> they were great. And the, and the fact that he shared a birthday with your son, Dash. And That's you right. And we had a wonderful birthday party joint for him and for Dash. So Yeah, that was the last Did time we saw him. Tricks, uh, Nora? What's that? Did he teach you any tricks? No, I'm incredibly clumsy with my hands. He was, <laughs> he, he, it was just him doing the magic, like pulling stuff out of his, you know, out of his uh, fist and up his sleeve. And he was, it was, he was so like giddy when he, he would come in. In fact, the last day that we saw him. Meta, it must be a metaphor for something. Yes. Deeper about his. Oh, yeah, he was yeah. just, he was playful and he was, there was a, a very childlike, you know, kind of joy to, to everything that he did, even when it was at its most. Did you, you, know. did you uh, hear his uh, imitations of Kissinger? He, he, <laughs> yes, <laughs> right, exactly. It's, pretty well. it's really good. <laughs> so good. Oh, yeah, it's... um. We there's so many things to remember, and I'm really glad that we had this opportunity. So I, I guess we really do need to wrap up sometime. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm not sure how to end. Oh, here, here's how I end this thing. So <laughs> thank you, Nora. Thank you, Richard. You two are such wonderful friends and compañeros, and um, just really appreciate everything that you've done here today and everything you do for Just World Educational. Thank you so Very much. Well. Thank